Welcome to Forbes Talks. Joining me now is Adam Minsky, senior contributor here at Forbes. Adam, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Of course, Adam, as you know, it has been a tumultuous year for student loan borrowers. Can you walk us through and give us a sense of what 2022 looked like in terms of student loan forgiveness? There's been a lot going on. Uh, the Biden administration initiated a number of programs. Uh, there was the limited PSLF waiver, uh, which ended in October and is still being processed, which provided um, a lot of loan forgiveness for folks who have devoted careers to nonprofit or government work. The administration announced the ramp up of the IDR account adjustment, uh, which is just getting started now and is expected to really take off next year. Uh, and that will provide some retroactive credit to borrowers seeking loan forgiveness under income driven plans. And of course, the big news was the one time cancellation initiative, which would have provided either 10,000 or 20,000 thousand dollars in debt cancellation for the vast majority of federal student loan borrowers uh, but then that got uh, blocked by federal courts and it now looks like the supreme court will ultimately uh, decide the fate of that program can you give us a sense of why it is being held up in court so there were a number of legal challenges. Um, you know, we could probably talk all day about why uh, those legal challenges were brought in the first place. Um, but ultimately, there's a question about whether or not the Biden administration um, acted within um, existing congressional authority when it used executive action to effectively cancel um, hundreds of billions of dollars in student debt for up to 40 million borrowers. Um, most of those lawsuits were dismissed by multiple federal courts, but two of them gained traction. Um, in one case, um, uh, a, a court in Texas uh, simply um, uh, vacated the program and declared that it was illegal. Uh, in another, um, a, an appeals court instituted a nationwide preliminary injunction freezing the program uh, while the legal battle continues. So how is this legal battle looking for the Biden administration? It's hard to say how it will ultimately end up, but it is going before the Supreme Court. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Supreme Court agreed to take up one of the cases and then just today agreed to take up the second case as well. It looks like there will be oral arguments um, on those two cases scheduled for sometime in February of 2023 with a decision to follow sometime after that. Most big Supreme Court, uh, court decisions are issued in June, um, so it could be uh, around June. 2023 when we'll get a final ruling. So let's talk about some possible scenarios here. So what happens if the court strikes down this program? If the court strikes down the program, then the program might effectively be dead. And then the question is, what does the Biden administration do from there? There's been some speculation that they could basically start from scratch and create a new program uh, based on a different legal authority and try to see if that works. But that could just invite a whole set of new legal challenges based on the authority of that. Uh, we're also waiting on the administration to release details on a new income driven repayment plan. There's some speculation that the administration has withheld the final regulations on that plan um, to possibly tweak it and make it a little bit more generous in the event that the loan cancellation program is struck down. And then, of course, there's this ongoing student loan pause, which the Biden administration recently extended to June 2023 directly in response to the Supreme Court litigation. Um, um, and there's some talk that the administration could simply keep on extending that pause in the event that the program is struck down. So right now, all eyes are on the Supreme Court, but it's hard to say what will happen if it doesn't go the administration's way. Of course. And then on the flip side, what if it does go the administration's way? Will borrowers be immediately impacted? So before the program was blocked, 26 million borrowers applied to the program, and according to top officials, around 16 million were already approved. So presumably, if the court um, allows the program to proceed, the 16 million borrowers who already were approved for loan forgiveness should presumably get their loans forgiven. The remaining applications that have already been submitted can then be processed. And then I would imagine that the administration will reopen the online application portal so those who haven't applied can do so. When the program was first announced, the application window would have gone until December 2023. So even if that timeline doesn't change, borrowers would still have several months to submit an application if they hadn't already done so. 
Earlier, you did mention the student loan payment pause, and you said it would end June 30th, 2023. Was this the last extension? Well, that's always been the question whenever they've extended the pause. We've heard several times uh, that this is the final extension. And then, of course, uh, that hasn't been the case and it's been extended again. Uh, notably, the administration has not used the word final when characterizing the most recent extension. They also didn't use the word final when they uh, extended at the time before this. Really, there's there's no way to know. Even the June 30th date itself is a little bit uh, not set in stone. The way the administration has characterized the latest extension is it's either June 30th or or whenever the resolution uh, uh, for this litigation is ultimately reached by the court. So it could be sooner than June 30th. Um, and then there's also a 60 day period after the pause ends before payments would actually resume, which means that effectively, if it goes all the way to June 30th, the soonest anyone would have to pay would actually be the end of August. But all this is to say, you know, all this, you know, we, we could see another extension or this could be it. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens next summer. It's definitely key that they didn't use the word final, but Congress initially imagined that this pause would only be six months back in March of 2020. But extensions from both Trump and Biden were made as a national emergency because of the pandemic. So realistically, how long, how many more pauses can we potentially see? It's a great question. So the legal authority that both the Trump administration and the Biden administration relied on to issue these multiple short term extensions are rooted in the HEROES Act of 2003, which allows modifications to federal loan programs in the event of a national emergency. Uh, coincidentally, that's the same authority that the administration relied on to implement the one time cancellation program as well. Um, but it is rooted in the pandemic. Um, and I think at some point, obviously, the pandemic emergency would end, as would uh, the legal basis for extending the pause. So it's unlikely that the pause can just be extended indefinitely on an open-ended basis. Um, we might see litigation um, um, uh, to try to stop uh, a further extension of the pause if that happens. So that's another angle that we'll have to keep an eye on next year. As you know, Republicans are retaking control of Congress come the new year. So will that impact anything in terms of student loans? Yes and no. Uh, so, so the GOP is poised to take over the House of Representatives with a slim majority. Um, that likely removes um, any realistic chance that Congress would pass some sort of student loan forgiveness legislation, for instance, to codify Biden's one-time cancellation program. But that didn't look like it was even happening under Democratic control of both houses of Congress. So that doesn't really change anything. The one area where uh, it really could come into play is the House of Representatives could potentially file its own lawsuit um, to challenge either this or a, a different loan cancellation program or another extension of the student loan pause, arguing uh, that the administration exceeded congressional authority in doing that. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if that happens. Do you think that lawsuit would have legs? It's possible. Um, you know, it's one of those things where uh, courts are sometimes wary um, of Congress or a uh, chamber of Congress, you know, stepping in to litigate. Um, but it's not necessarily totally unprecedented. Um, and if a court determines that they have standing to do that, uh, it could be an issue. Earlier, you did mention income driven repayment plans, which are expected for 2023. So can you explain what they are? So an income-driven plan, or IDR for short, is an umbrella term that describes a collection of individual plans that are all a little bit different, but at a basic level, uh, they all function in a similar way. They use a formula applied to the borrower's income. Typically, their adjusted gross income is reported on their federal tax return and adjusted for family size, and it results in a uniquely calculated monthly payment for the borrower that gets adjusted every year. So as the borrower's income changes, the payment changes. Um, and over time, some borrowers will pay off their loans in full, uh, but others will not. And depending on the specific plan, after 20 or 25 years, 
any remaining balance could be forgiven. Now that could be treated as taxable income to the borrower uh, that's exempted to the end of 2025 under temporary legislation. Um, but that's generally how the programs work. Uh, there's been two major changes uh, to income driven repayment. One is this IDR account adjustment, which is a one-time fix that will allow certain past periods that otherwise wouldn't have counted towards the borrower's loan forgiveness term to be credited. That includes certain periods of repayment as well as some periods of deferment and forbearance. And that can cause uh, some folks ultimately to get much closer to that loan forgiveness threshold than they otherwise would have been. There also is a new income-driven plan that the, the Biden administration uh, has mentioned is, is currently in development. Based on the few details that we have, it sounds like that plan might be more affordable for a large number of borrowers, but final regulations have not yet been released, and so we're still waiting on those details. Could these changes face any potential legal challenges? It's possible. So far, there are uh, not any indications of that. The IDR account adjustment was announced many months ago, and so far there's been no legal challenges to that, but I suppose anything is possible. In terms of the new income-driven plan, uh, the regulatory authority of the Education Department to issue new plans under existing statute um, is fairly broad. It's totally different from the HEROES Act disputes that we're seeing. Um, so there, I suppose there could be a challenge to that, but um, I think that there's general agreement that there's less room for dispute in terms of the Education Department's authority to craft a new income-driven plan. 2023, you wrote for Forbes that uh, borrowers need to buckle up because it could potentially be a more wild ride than even 2022. So you also write that new regulations are usually good news for borrowers. Why is that? <laughs> Well, not always, but in this case, I think the new regulations are good news. The administration has been working on the last couple of years to develop new regulations governing nearly every major federal student loan program, and the changes are largely good for borrowers. This includes programs like public service loan forgiveness, the total permanent disability discharge, borrower defense to repayment, which allows folks to request a loan discharge on the basis of school misconduct, and a number of other programs. Um, there's a whole bunch of changes. Um, and these changes largely are borrower friendly. They're designed to make it uh, easier for borrowers to qualify, easier for borrowers to apply, and easier for borrowers to get relief. Those changes are all set to be effective as of July 1st, 2023. So that's good news. The bad news is that whenever programs are changed or tweaked, especially on a mass scale, there's always room for problems. Uh, the rollout might be bumpy. Um, the Department of Ed relies on a network of contracted loan servicers to implement these changes, and uh, there's not exactly a great track record um, of uh, these types of changes going smoothly. So changes in this particular context, I think, are good, but doesn't mean it's not going to be problem free. So in that sense, how can borrowers best prepare to avoid any bumpy roads or any confusion? Well, for one thing, since most borrowers' payments have been on pause now for over two years and will exceed three years by the time this, this latest extension ends, um, make sure that you have all the latest information on these programs. Uh, the, the, the U.S. Department of Education does publish some uh, pretty good fact sheets at studentaid.gov. Make sure that your loan contact information, um, uh, email address, phone number, mailing address are all up to date, especially if you've moved. Um, Reevaluate your repayment plan options, especially if your current circumstances are different from what they were when the pause first went into effect in 2020. I think we can all speak to the fact that last few years have uh, been, uh, you know, lots of up and downs for people. Uh, you might have moved, you might have gotten married, you might have gotten divorced, uh, you might have changed jobs. Um, so whatever it is, uh, whatever was going on with your loans before the pause went into effect, it's a good idea to kind of do a, a check in uh, and, and, and see what makes the most sense for you now, given your updated situation and given the new changes that will be in effect soon. Definitely. Adam Minsky, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.